Hi everybody, it's Robert Alanese and this is the Collecting the King show. This is episode 42 and we're calling this one There's a Brand New Day on the Horizon and that's a song from the movie Roustabout. And we're calling it that because it's going to be about the future of collecting Elvis. Uh, This is something that's been on my mind a lot lately, mostly because I sell on eBay and then I've been doing a lot of research on the internet and I'm always checking out posts and trying to keep my eye on uh, what's happening in the Elvis collecting world. Uh, As you know, I've been a part of that Elvis collecting world for many, many years, over 40 years. Uh, I did work on three of the price guides with Jerry Osborne. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be redundant, but I have. I've been keeping track of the Elvis world and the collecting world and how people collect, what they collect, what's valuable, what's not valuable, what's going up, what's going down, what's the trend, what's hot, what's not. Uh, It's kind of been the thing I've been doing my whole life, uh, or at least 45 years of it. And I've noticed lately, I've noticed some uh, things that have been happening that I thought uh, that I would talk about, things that have been uh, kind of I don't know, uh, disturbing to me or interesting to me, things that I think are just worth talking about. But before we get started, if you like the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and then also hit the bell to be informed about all future upcoming shows. In the beginning, as far back as the 50s and 60s, Elvis Presley collectors found records for their collections by most common means, which was in most cases local record stores, department stores like Sears, Montgomery Wards, Community Discount Center, and in the 70s at retail media entertainment chains like Music Land or Sound Goody. Usually you find those in a mall. However, it wasn't easy to find earlier pressings in these stores as most of them only sold the latest releases. Used record stores, antique malls, flea markets, and garage sales were the only way to find earlier pressings at that time. Then came the record dealer. There were a lot of dealers who would put ads in the back of Goldmine, and you could, you know, contact them and say what records you're looking for. Or some of them would have like little catalogs, and they would put in, uh, uh, you know, what they had available and what the prices were. Thanks to Goldmine magazine and the birth of record conventions, these individuals, including myself, sold earlier and rare records and memorabilia at premium prices to compensate for their time and efforts to obtain them. As a record dealer myself, I would travel all around the country. I went to uh, California. I went to Austin, Texas. There's a big record show there, which is fantastic. Always found a lot of great stuff there, and it's still going on today. And if you've never been to the Austin record show, you definitely should go. It's an it's incredible experience for vinyl collectors of not just Elvis but all vinyl. I I went to many many different places hunting down records. Las Vegas was one of my main places to go because I found not just records but memorabilia and stuff from Las Vegas. You know back then prices would depend mostly on one thing supply and demand. The harder it was to find something the higher the value and the higher the price. As the hobby of collecting Elvis grew, it became necessary for collectors to have some way to determine the going prices of the earlier and rarer pressings. Out of that need came two of the most popular record price guides, Presliana and the Goldmine Record Price Guides, with Presliana being the first book dedicated entirely to Elvis Presley. Throughout the 80s and the 90s, these were the only ways to find the rare treasures, until... The World Wide Web was released to the public on April 30th, 1993 by the European Organization for Nuclear Research, also known as CERN. This made it possible for everyone to use the internet by allowing them to navigate it with a browser. Users could also create their own websites with pictures, videos, and sound and link to other sites using hyperlink words or phrases. Once the internet was introduced, along came a little thing called eBay. eBay was founded by Pierre Omidyar, I hope that's the correct pronunciation, in September of 1995. It has 132 million yearly active buyers worldwide and handled $73 billion in transactions in 2023, 48% of which was in the United States. 
There was now a way to find Elvis records and memorabilia, which slowly started to affect the whole supply and demand scenario. The rare and highly sought after Elvis items of the past were now becoming easier for collectors to find. The result of this was a drastic change in value and prices. The Presiana price guide, for example, changed as the years went by to reflect this. One of the biggest changes was the elimination of condition price ranges. Eventually, all prices in the book became strictly for mint condition only. Any condition below that is reduced by percentages as explained in the book. So basically, if a record is valued at $100 and in mint condition and you have it in VG condition or very good condition, it basically cuts the price in half down to about a value of $50. And remember, these are always estimates. Uh, because of the market changing constantly, we had to go with more like estimates of, uh, of value based on our knowledge of, of what was happening in the Elvis collector world. Discogs was launched in the year 2000 by American programmer, DJ, and music fan Kevin Lewandowski, who wanted to create a database for his own collection, adding about 250 records to it. Many new and younger generation collectors believe that Discogs is the best place to buy vinyl. In my opinion, buying vinyl off of Discogs is really no, no different than any other uh, platform where the buyer has to be careful about either the seller overgrading or their lack of knowledge. Based on a recent search, for example, of Elvis's first album, the LPM, 1254. There were over a thousand listings of various releases of this LP. When I was able to find an original 1956 pressing, they were all in the condition that if I had them, I probably would have thrown them in the garbage before ever considering listing them. I've also noticed that it's made today's collectors much more anal than before. You know, back in the early days, collectors were just happy to get the original pressings. They really could care less about which factory it came from. The only time a, a factory mattered was if a pressing had something different on the label. These deep grooves and these flat grooves and all this other stuff just really didn't mean it much of anything. But I guess as time has gone by, collectors now are looking for every little thing. But I, I do believe a lot of that has to do with uh, Discogs. In Presleyana, if you look in the book, there's actually a few pages where you can actually see labels listed. And we show the different variations of labels. But there was never all that much attention paid to that. They want all these different variations. It's almost as though, you know, they're not happy with just the first pressing. It's got to be every single factory and every single thing. And again, I don't care. I mean, if that's what everybody wants to do, that's fine with me. I personally don't care whether it's deep groove or anything like that. But that's, you know, I'm old school. I'm just happy to have the first pressing. Very concerned about where this is all going. Uh, don't get me wrong. I think it's great when someone finds a mint stereo copy of, of Speedway, for example, in the shrink wrap with the sticker in the photo for like only $10. And it's in the book for 125. Hey, I'm I'm happy for you. I'm glad you found something because a lot of people do that. I, I was just on eBay today, and a couple people had noticed. Oh, I found this rare harem scarum, or I found this or that with the photo, or or this or that, and I paid nothing for it. Okay, well that's fine. That's great. It's wonderful that you're finding this thing, but it's happening more and more and more where people are finding the really rare records at one time for like next to nothing prices. Now, it's funny because I know, and John Johnny B agrees with me and other collectors do too, that when they find it that, and they only paid $10 for it, they're going to go, oh, wow, I got that for $10, but it's worth 150 So they're going to think that down the road, it's going to be worth $150. So when they go to sell it, they can use that as a selling point and say, okay, well, it's $150, right? Well, here's my point. If time goes by and you keep finding original 60s albums with the shrink wrap and the sticker and the photo for $10 to $20, and as time goes by, that's going to be the new norm. That's going to be the price it's going for. They're only going to be worth $10 or $20 because of that whole, you know, uh, supply and demand thing I was talking about. You know, if... If the, if the supply is abundant, 
because of the internet, which it has become over the years, then the values and the, the values of these records are going to go down. They're not going to go up. Sure, it's going to be great to be able to say, hey, I've got originals, but the originals are not worth as much as they used to be. Nowadays, I see some co collectors paying large amounts of cash for, you know, new releases like the FTD vinyl, which everybody knows those go for a lot of money, but they struggle to pull out their wallet to pay for an original. Some people will pay as much as $250 for an FTD, but if they find a mint 1254 from 1956, eh, I don't know if I want to pay 100, you know, $250. You know, there's more of those out there. So because there's more of those out there, you know, I'll find a nicer one for a lesser price. But I better grab that FTD because they're limited. So I think you can see the logic here. It's kind of strange, but, it, you know, things are going through this weird transition. The older records aren't as important or not as uh, uh, sought after or desirable as the newer stuff on uh, Facebook, people say, oh, I was at a flea market and I found something for 10 cents. Or I was here or there and I found something. And they're finding some pretty rare things. So I'm thinking to myself, well, this is just going to bring the value down. I mean, if they're becoming more and more and more common at a lower price, then it goes down. When Jerry and I worked on the book, uh, you know, one of the main things that we always paid attention to was what the market bared. If, if you're finding all these old ones for next to nothing, then the, the values have got to drop. Back in the old days, before the Internet, it was hard to find stuff, really hard. And because it was hard to find, the stuff was more valuable and people were willing to pay more. But now the time has gone by people don't want to pay those prices anymore. So what does this mean for all the collectors who over the past 40 or 50 years have spent good money for the then hard to find originals, only to know that when they go to sell them, their value is only a small fraction of what they originally paid. I've been doing this for a long time and it's weird seeing what's happening to the world of collecting Elvis. Now, if you're my age or if you've been collecting for a long, long time, when you hear the word reissue, you think, oh, well, those are real common and there's hundreds and thousands of those out there. And there are. But let's not forget that some of these reissues have really unique and rare things about them that make them the, the, the future collectible. Like, say, 20 years from now, a reissue of a certain album with a variation of a, 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 not a factory mistake, like a mistake label or whatever, but I'm talking about mistakes where RCA made a legitimate mistake. I always use for LP fans only the reissue where the cover on the front is the same as the cover on the back. That's not just a factory mistake, but that's a big mistake. Somebody in, in RCA really screwed up. That album now, even to this day, is worth, you know, a good penny. So in the 80s, 70s and 80s, there are albums like that that are similar or albums that purposely have a cover change or something that, that makes it collectible. And I'll give you a couple examples. Here's a good example right here. All right, this is um, Elvis on stage, and this is a reissue, AQL1 reissue. Some of you already know about this album, the reason why the AQL is rarer than the original LSP. Maybe not as rare as the AFL1, and definitely not as rare as the TAN, but this one is unique because it has the different back cover. The back cover, of course, is a different shot. RCA changed the back cover. This is a, a, a different picture than the one that was on the original pressing. This is also, I believe, a... Um, yes, this is also what um, what I call a, a wraparound cover. So there's not slicks glued to the cardboard. When they went to the wraparound cover on this one, they, you know, they changed the back. And uh, not really sure why. But this makes this record definitely a, an oddball rarity similar to the uh, LP fans only with the same slick on both sides. But this is a, uh, you know, this is a future collectible. This is a future high dollar item. And this is what I'm predicting. 20 years from now, people who collect Elvis will want this copy or this version of this album. 
As a matter of fact, there might be people who are looking for this album right now. And they should, because it's a, it's a great addition to your collection because it's such an oddball piece. Another one would be this one here. All right, a lot of people uh, uh, may or may not know about this one, but this is, of course, Elvis Sings for Children, right? No big deal, uh, obviously not. But this is uh, either the reissue of it or the record club issue. I'm not really 100% sure which one it is. But the reason why this one is unique is because on the back cover, you know, this, of course, is the, you know, the greeting card uh, that, w that came with the first pressing. But on this cover, the greeting card is actually a part of the back cover. So it's not separated at all. The picture is just on the cover. There is no card. And to make things even more interesting, it's not a gatefold cover. It's just a regular single pocket cover. It has the same uh, label and everything as the uh, original, pretty much. I don't, rem I don't think there's any uh, change in the number, and I don't see an RE on it anywhere. But anyway, this is an oddball piece. I've only had a few of these uh, over the years, but this is, you're looking at a future collector's item. This is going to be something down the road. Remember, this came out in 78. So, you know, we're talking, what, it's going on 50 years old. That's another thing that's funny is, you know, when you, when people have been collecting a long time, think of reissues, they think, oh, it's a reissue from the 70s and 80s. That's a long time ago, folks. That's changed. I mean, we're, we're in 2024 now. I know there's a lot of them out there, especially the original, but try and find the single pocket. It's, it's not easy. And then another reissue or a, a series of reissues that are interesting. A lot of people know about this album. This is a 1985 gold label. All right, and that's the Elvis uh, 50th uh, gold label. You'll notice it's black. And there was just a short period of time where, for some reason, they decided to go with black vinyl instead of green. The green one is the one that's more common. This is not the only record uh, of this series. There was a Valentine Gift for You, Always on My Mind, along with this album, all came out on different color vinyls as a um, anniversary thing to make them unique. And then for some reason, they came out afterwards on black for a short period of time. Another good example would be the tan labels, the AFL1 prefix labels, and, and cover variations like the Elvis on stage I just showed you with the different back cover, which are now highly sought after and are commanding higher prices in the Elvis collector's world even today. I am constantly asked if there's ever going to be another Presley on a price guide. If there was, and if I had anything to do with it, the book would have to reflect all of these changes. And there's been quite a few since Presley Anna 8, uh, the last edition that came out on the, the 40th anniversary of Elvis's passing. All the new collectors who, who aren't aware of Presley Anna, they're relying on Discogs. I hear all the time, I hear people go, well, it's going for this on Discogs. It's going for that on Discogs. I know they're just basically looking at all the prices and taking an average, I guess. And then they're going, well, the average is like this. I think it's nice to have a, a Presley and a book or a place to go where it says, okay, if it's absolutely mint condition, then this is what it should go for. And then make your judgments about what you're going to pay or what you're going to sell it for based on that. So how would... How would we go about determining what the value is based on this new crazy market where everything's all over the board? It wasn't easy to put the other book to do the other book because we we were constantly looking on eBay. Uh, this was you know before Discogs came along, or at least before anybody paid attention to Discogs as a pricing tool. We also had people who were collectors that contributed to the book, saying, "Okay, I bought it for this, or I sold it for this, or I saw it for this." So it was really a, a combination of a lot of people coming in and and saying, this is what we saw it go for or what we think it's worth. And then we would just add it all up and kind of, you know, come up with a, a, a price or an estimate based on all of that. And that's what we would have to do again. But this time, it would definitely be a lot more difficult to do. You know, back in the 90s, I once did an interview on ABC TV in Chicago I think it was a morning show where I had gone on the air and I brought a bunch of Elvis memorabilia and stuff. I think it was around the 25th anniversary I did this. So on this morning show, I was there 
you know, showing collectibles and talking about the value of those collectibles. And of course, this was the 25th anniversary. So uh, the prices and everything were, you know, fairly high. I brought some really great stuff, memorabilia and records and whatever. And I said that I thought collecting Elvis Presley records and memorabilia was one of the wisest financial investments that anybody could make as a collector. Now, I still believe that to an extent, but the world of collecting Elvis Presley records and memorabilia has changed so much over the past 40 years that I can't help but be concerned about the future. That being said, there is definitely a brand new day on the horizon, and I have no idea where it's all going to go, but we can at least kind of look at the way things were and kind of predict where things are going. It'll be interesting for sure to see what happens with the FTD vinyls. You know, they still command a big price because they're limited. But I wonder how long, how long are people going to want those? Not only that, but if the prices keep going up on those, how many people are going to be willing to pay these, you know, really high prices for these things? It'll be interesting to see. It's time for the black box. I know it's been a while since I've pulled anything out of here interesting, but I thought I would show you a, a few cool things that that I found uh, recently and, and a couple things that maybe you're not aware of that I thought would be worthwhile talking about. So let's take a look in the box and see what we got. All right, first of all, I was talking about how reissues are going to be the future collectible, high dollar collectibles. And I wanted to show you some interesting things that I found. First of all, let's start with this. This, of course, is a uh, Elvis as recorded at Madison Square Garden. It says AQL on the wraparound sticker. And then on the back, up here, the cover says AFL1. That means that this cover is an AFL1 cover. Now, if you look at the record, the record is an AQL1. Let me show you why it caught my attention. This is the LSP. And if I'm correct, this is a 76 black label LSP. And it is. And if you look at the back cover, it has the two ads for Elvis Now and the Camden album, Elvis Sings Hits, from his movies, Volume 2. I also found I had another AQL1, all right, except this one has AQL1 on the cover. There's no wraparound. And on the back, it says AQL1. As a matter of fact, it even says it up in the corner. We all know that the original came out this way, and it has the two, the two albums on the back advertised. And we know that later, the AQL also did the same thing with a single on the back. Then how is it that this one, an AFL1 back cover, why is it only showing Elvis now? I thought it was exclusive to the AQL, but this is saying that the AFL1, which is a 1977 reissue, went to a single cover. thing that's unusual if this is the same cover as this the aql at the bottom it's an re1 this one is an is just simply an re i'm just not sure why an afl1 record cover maybe they have this i don't know if anybody out there knows maybe it has only the single uh, the Elvis Now ad on the AFL ones of this. I don't know. Maybe uh, AFL ones of these are very, very, very hard to find. It's one of the rarer <coughs> of the AFL prefixes. If anybody out there knows, let me know. But it still doesn't explain why it has a, an AQL one sticker on an AFL one cover, and then the record is AQL one. This seems like just a factory mix up. Um, but it could be a mistake. I guess the only way to know for sure is if, in, if the AFL1 uh, back cover was, uh, had only Elvis Now on it. 
if, if it only had Elvis now, then this would be an AFL1 cover with an AQL1 sticker and an AQL1 record. Anyway, I thought it was interesting, so I figured I'd show it to you. Now, here's another rare album. This one, of course, is Elvis Now. It has an AFL1 wraparound sticker. The reason it's cool is because it's the rare side A and side B tan label variation. These are becoming really, really hard to find. I know there's collectors out there who have these. I wouldn't be surprised if Mike Butcher has both of them because Mike's got like everything, I think. And if he doesn't have everything, he's trying to get everything. It's a very rare variation. There is also an Elvis Country that has a, a side A, B, and there's also back in Memphis. But I just found this recently, and I have to be honest, I think in my lifetime, all the years I've been doing this, I've only had this record maybe three times ever. This is pretty cool, pretty rare. If you ever find the side A, side B variation of Elvis Now or uh, Back in Memphis or Elvis Country, those are pretty rare. And I'm, I'm going to make a prediction. I'm going to say that down, down the road, 20 years from now, this variation is going to be in the hundreds. That's my prediction. Could be right, could be wrong, but that's my prediction. And now a collector's item from the black box that I don't, I don't even know if, any, if too many people even realize this. But uh, here is the box set. All right, this is from my own collection. And I wanted, I wanted to show this because I thought it was pretty cool. Not too many people know this. I've shown this to some people that have, uh, you know, come to my place and I've shown them this record. And I remember when I first found it, I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. But the more and more I found this box set, the more I realized that the, the one I kept was well worth keeping, not just for the condition. Because when I found it, when I found it, it's really in beautiful shape. I mean, it is mint, an absolute mint condition. But the key, the thing about this, which makes it really cool is number one of course it has you know the original book everybody knows what that is that's the book that came inside but here's what's weird even though the inside has the black and white inner sleeves all right the records are rigid and i know you can't tell you'd have to almost feel them but it's rigid these are rigid records you know this is where that whole deep groove and flat label thing comes in and i've already proven that the flat labels and the deep groove labels are not a determining factor as to which is rigid which is not because i've seen rigids of both this does not have the deep groove label but it's rigid these these records are are solid now, does it have, they have a little give? Sure, they have a little give, but not, but very much like the originals did. You know, that, that's, that's the thing about it. They, they're, they have a little bit of give to them, but they're, they're, they're pretty solid. So, you know, here, here, this one too. See, it's got a little bit of a bend, but not much. I noticed that even if you take the book out of the box, this thing is really heavy. It's much heavier than the second one this is the volume two and it's also an original it has all the you know the cloth swatch and everything inside this one is light this one is definitely heavier so go figure so i thought i i thought i'd show it because i i just wanted to point out that i do believe that there were rigid pressings of this box set so if you have this box set you might want to check it out and compare it, especially if you have the second one, to the to the second one, and see you know what the weight difference is. But um, rigid vinyl. So that about wraps up things for this show. Uh, coming soon, I have many great shows planned for the future, including another show with book author Joe Tunzi, 
who will be here to talk about his new book about Elvis's concerts in Chicago in 76 and 77. And we'll also be talking about the book he did on Elvis's concert in Chicago on 72, of which I attended all three shows. So I'm very excited to have him back on the show. Um, and it should be a real interesting one because I can talk about what it was like being there. He can talk about the book and and uh, all the different nonsense of things that went into making the book. And he also talked about the possibility of doing a giveaway on the show. So you might want to tune into that show and see what that's all about. Also, I want to announce the return of Johnny B, who has decided, after selling his entire original Elvis collection about a year ago, and we talked about it on the show he was on, he is now in the process of obtaining another complete collection of originals. And believe it or not, he's almost got it all back again. I mean, I don't know how many times he sold his, he got an original set and then sold it and then uh, went back to get it. But I think this is the third time he's done it and he's almost completed that collection again. So um, uh, he'll tell us how that's all coming along and how he went about uh, acquiring it again. Uh, but I will say it has a lot to do with some of the things I was talking about, about how the value of originals are going down or the price is going down. Also, the collector from Knoxville, Neil Spencer, who was just on the last show, episode 41, he's coming back with even more great collector's items to show you. So that show is coming up. And then uh, uh, also a very special show is coming up with a very special guest who uh, was um, involved with Elvis on tour, uh, actually went on tour with Elvis Presley, and we're working on getting that guest here. Uh, and uh, it looks like it's going to happen. So that's coming up, too, and that's uh, be a, that'll be a surprise guest, and we'll announce that when, when we get closer to it. Thank you for watching the show, and I'm out of here again. <laughs> <laughs>